Well, good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be with you in worship. Um, those of you at the buffet line, I think it's closing. Um, it's a joy to be with you all. Our choir is going to start off um, this morning in worship, and um, I think you're going to uh, enjoy what's going to happen here. So over the last uh, year and a half or so, we've had lots of conversations in, in, in choir on Wednesday nights about what it means to worship and about different ways we worship and about, um, you know, some, some churches really choose to stick with, the, um, with their own uh, cultural biases when it comes to worship. And sometimes for us, uh, Anglo, primarily Southern Baptist, that means standing here and singing and there's not a whole lot of movement sometimes. Well, we're going to shake things up just a little bit. Um, I've asked them to get out of their comfort zone just a little bit. And so we're going to see what happens. All right. Uh, we're going to begin worship with this, a celebratory song, a call to worship, bless the Lord.
Excellent, excellent, excellent. That song was only missing one thing. Next time, more cowbell. <laughs> Very good. All right. Great to see you all today. Glad you're worshiping with us, not only here, but we know we have our online visitors as well on uh, our Facebook Live stream. So welcome, welcome to worship today. Um, if I haven't met you yet, I'm Pastor James. Would love to have the opportunity to do so. If you're a newcomer or a guest here, we welcome you to worship with us. If you have not already and are a guest, here it is. We have this guest information card. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, place it in the offering plate when it comes by a little bit later on, or you can put it in the info table out in the uh, foyer, or I'll be available right after the service. We also have uh, these prayer cards. If you have a prayer request that you would like to make, uh, these prayer cards are located out in the um, out in the foyer, and you can be as anonymous as you want to be uh, with these as well. And and myself and our prayer team will certainly uh, be praying over those. Well, so it's March Madness, isn't it? Well, the Longhorns won. Baylor's playing today. Yeah, the Aggies lost. They're gone. They're done. So... Uh, so I know y'all are paying attention to that as, as well. But I wanted to remind us of where our loyalties uh, at a spiritual level truly lie. And we're going to talk about uh, our loyalty to God and why uh, we are called to worship Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength today. But this is a reminder as we start our service from Romans chapter 12. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for a great, lively start to our worship this morning. We thank you for this time of year, especially now as we are really honing in on Palm Sunday and Holy Week and Easter. And we're reminded of the fact that uh, you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Not because we're good enough to be in your light, because we have it all figured out. But while we were yet sinners, you died for us on the cross. You died that we may have life and have it more abundantly. And because of that, Lord, we are called to submit our all to you to give everything that we have heart, soul, mind, and strength to you, to be in reconciled relationship with you, that we may not only serve you, but in doing so, we also serve our neighbor and love them as we love ourselves. Help us, Lord, as we worship today in spirit and in truth to give of our bodies a living sacrifice. Help us not to just go through motions today, sing a few songs, say a few prayers, listen to a message, and then go eat lunch but Lord help us to be devoted help us to find our rest in you again today help us to be equipped by your Holy Spirit for the spiritual battles that we go through during the week and we pray all these things in Jesus name Amen Let's stand as we sing together. Blessed be the name. Two, three. Yes. 
nobody but Jesus who rescued me from the grave. Appreciate that new song, preparing for Easter. I hope to use that on Easter Sunday morning. Let's have a seat at this time. John, I mean, John, the, uh, John 2, verses 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple the courts. He found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting in tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from, from the temple courts, both sheep, cattle, and scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for a home, for the house you will continue consuming. The Jews who uh, then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. They replied, it, was, it, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? So, but the temple he had spoken was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Let us pray. Dear Holy Father, Lord, just want to thank you for this awesome day and for everybody that's here today. Uh, we thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus. Can't do it without him. Guide us and direct us to do your will throughout the week. We will Pastor James as he brings our message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Yes, 
if you're able and join us in singing this great song. Yeah. 
this morning celebrating the fact that you um, are Lord of all, that you are a God that we can count in and trust in. And Jesus, we honor you in this time, in this moment. May your word ever be on our lips as we sing your praise. May you receive blessing and honor and glory and power through the worship this morning, and may your spirit uh, dwell in Pastor James as he brings a word from your message. We pray in your name. Amen. I want to thank uh, John and the choir and band this morning. They took us through uh, just about every genre of music uh, out there, and I really appreciate that. Did a great job today. Thank you. Appreciate our, our worship team. Well, we continue our journey today through the book of Hebrews. We're going through Hebrews during this Lenten season and culminating on Easter Sunday, which is just a few weeks away now. But uh, we're going to continue now in Hebrews chapter 9. So we're going to go forward a few chapters from where we were last Sunday. But Hebrews chapter 9 this week verses 11 through 22. If you have a copy of the Scripture or would like to pull that up on your phone, however you want to access that, I would call your attention there. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 22. The title or the subject of the message this morning is When Jesus Shows Up. When Jesus Shows Up. Hebrews 9, 11 through 22. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with human hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through, the, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore... Even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Let's pray together. God, we come now to a, a passage that uh, is quite dense, takes a little context to understand. And so I pray that you would open our understanding, open our minds and our eyes to see exactly what you are communicating through this author, not only to the people to whom he wrote, but also to us today. May it be clear. And I pray, God, that you would use this message in a very special way for each and every person who is listening, and also for our church as a whole, especially as we are now on this track of worship in this season of Lent, culminating in Easter. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So centuries and centuries ago, uh, 386 A.D. to be exact, there was a young man living back then. His name was Augustine. Some people call him Augustine. Have you ever heard that name? There's a picture of him here. That was a Polaroid taken at the time. 
Um, Augustine or Augustine, it kind of depends on which theologian you ask as to how to pronounce his name. There's a big argument about that among some scholars. I'll call him Augustine. He was a brilliant man, very inquisitive. In fact, he had studied uh, philosophers like Cicero and Plato, and he had uh, found a great thirst for wisdom. He dabbled in a very fashionable religion of the time called Manichaeism, which was kind of this uh, sort of a mix between Buddhism and a little bit of Christianity thrown in. It's kind of weird. But when he got to Milan, he went to Milan, Italy, to begin to teach rhetoric. He was an educator. When he got to Milan, he started going to church at a local congregation there where a preacher was preaching a pastor by the name of Ambrose, very eloquent pastor. When he began to go to church there, the Holy Spirit started to work on Augustine. Jesus showed up. And on one particular day in Milan, it was a spring day, nice day, Augustine thought, I'm going to go outside and enjoy this day. And so he went outside, but his heart was really struggling. His mind was struggling. He thought, I'm just going to get outside and try to enjoy the day, but he couldn't enjoy it because he was under such conviction from the Holy Spirit. He was struggling with giving up his old life and committing his life solely to Jesus Christ. It was a struggle. And as he was praying about this and contemplating this, he heard some children off in the distance playing. It was a nice spring day. Some kids were out playing. And they were beginning to chant like they were playing a game. And he hadn't heard this chant before. It was really interesting. The children said this. They said, pick it up, read it. Pick it up, read it. Now that's odd for kids to be saying that. I've never heard my children chant those words. And Augustine thought, that is really odd. These kids are weird. But then he thought, maybe God's Spirit is talking to me through these kids. And he rushed to find a copy of the Scripture to pick it up and read it. And as he read, he picked out Romans chapter 13. In fact, he just opened up his Bible and said, I'm just going to read immediately what I find there. Now, that's not, I wouldn't advocate that, all right? Because sometimes you can take scriptures way out of context just by flipping it open and putting your finger in a place and do it. But Augustine did that. Sometimes the Spirit uses that. And he flipped open to Romans chapter 13, a passage in which Paul said, put off the old life and the old lusts and put on Christ. Augustine, in that moment, he wrote about this in a diary, and he said this. Let me quote him. He said, instantly, as that sentence concluded, there was infused in my heart something like the light of full certainty, and all the gloom of doubt vanished away. Jesus showed up for him, and almost immediately, Augustine quit his job, surrendered to ministry, took a year to study, was baptized, and then went on to be used of God as one of the greatest theologians and preachers in church history. 386 A.D. Now, how in the world does that relate to Hebrews 9 and what we're going through today? Well, as I look around the neighborhoods of Austin and Central Texas. I'm finding a lot of people, maybe even some of you here today or watching online, I'm finding a lot of people struggling with the same things that Augustine was struggling with in the 380s. In other words, many people today are curious and inquisitive, which is great, but that inquisitiveness can lead to ritualistic, 
legalistic, societal, mystical religion. A sacrificial religion and a sacrificial system that's just of the world and doesn't cleanse anything. For instance, let me give you some examples about what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, Augustine struggled with this mystical religion of monachianism, which is really not around anymore today, but let me tell you what the religions of today are that people struggle with. One is politics. Now let's go there. Make no mistake, politics is a religion today with some sacrificial system. Worship services are conducted on YouTube, Twitter, and your preferred prod podcast provider. The Ten Commandments are brought down on high by a politician, whoever is deemed the messianic figure of the day. Its sacrificial system is vast. In fact, the most faithful people in that religion are willing to become violent, sacrifice their children, education, and their, even their own sexuality in order to prove how right and virtuous and clean they are. And every two years, and especially every four, we offer the atoning sacrifice at the altar of the ballot box and elect a high priest. But that's not the only religion. Y'all are quiet. I'm preaching today. Okay. There's the religion of monetary gain. Which sacrificial system doesn't provide atonement for sin either. It just requires you to get more and more. There's a religion of sexuality which requires us to sacrifice all restraint. It requires us to sacrifice, sacrifice even biological truth in order to find enlightenment. There's also the religion of religion. Church family, we're guilty of this one. We pour so much energy into meetings. We pour so much energy into achieving a bottom line. Organizing ourselves and advertising ourselves to be a Fortune 500 church. Trying to be influencers. Getting the right brand. But why? What's it all for? Who are we trying to appease? Friends, the real threat to the church today, if I can just say this, doesn't come from the changing world out there that we're so scared of. The real threat to the church today comes from an unchanging God. A God who has showed up to deliver us from our worn out religion of politics and sex and money grabbing and status quo church life. We are to serve the unchanging God who sometimes comes to us in the voice of a child and says, pick it up and read it. And man, when you pick up and read Hebrews chapter 9, it changes everything. For instance, you'll find that when Christ shows up, He doesn't just condone the ways we've always done it. Christ did not come to condone what you and I want to do in our man-made tabernacles. Christ did not condone what you and I want to do, period. The Bible says that He is our great high priest entered through a greater and more perfect tabernacle than anything we could create through our politics, sex, and religion. In fact, He Himself is our place of worship. Destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And He got up on that cross, friends, and He once and for all illustrated that there's no way for politics to get you to God. 
There is no way for sex to get you to God or money or all the committee meetings you want. The only way to get right with God is through putting your absolute faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who gave of himself for our atonement and the remission of our sins. Take it and read it. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say it another way. Stop trying to put on legalistic nonsense. You just need Jesus. When Jesus shows up, he does not say, go do this sacrifice, go vote for this person, become woke, become ultra conservative, make all this money in your career, or just watch this TV network, or become a social media influencer. Jesus doesn't even say, go listen to that preacher. He'll do all the God stuff for you. Jesus says, come follow me. His way is the greatest, most complete, most powerful way to encounter the living God because he himself is the tabernacle. Lay all your religions down and worship Christ. Because, friend, if you aren't worshiping Christ, you are worshiping yourself. And also, when you pick it up and read it, you find that when Christ shows up, His sacrificial blood is sufficient for all you need. Verses 12 through 14 of the text indicate two things primarily that the blood of Jesus does. One thing is that his blood obtains eternal redemption. Now, what does that mean? Let me spell that out in non-churchy sounding terms. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, his sacrifice was perfect for our sins. Why? Because he is and was sinless. No blemishes. His sinless blood atones for everything we've done wrong and everything we will do wrong. Jesus' blood completely and utterly, a thousand percent, brings about liberation from sin. And so when you bow down to Jesus Christ as your king, you receive eternal redemption. That doesn't just mean you get to go to heaven. Eternal means perpetual redemption. When you bow the knee to Christ now, perpetually you receive life, now and forevermore. So let me ask you something. Can the blood of bulls and goats do that for you? Can the approval of your peers because you vote right and use the right pronouns obtain your atonement? No. Can your ability to attend a church service 52 weeks out of the year atone for all of your sin? No. Now, these things may pacify you and pacify others. They will make you look clean on the outside. But Jesus saw Pharisees who were clean on the outside, but they had death on the inside, and he said, you're just a bunch of whitewashed tombs. Woo People have put so much energy into their reputations and putting on a good face to look clean. But are they? See, Jesus is not looking for actors. He's looking for sinners. And if you're a sinner, come on. <laughs> if you're tired of trying to appease the gods of this world just by acting right, come to Jesus. He'll save you. You won't have to worry about that mess anymore. It won't matter any, anymore to you. 
In fact, let me, I need to chase a rabbit real quick. And there, <laughs> sometimes I, uh, I, I have to admit something to you. You probably will find this to be just kind of weird that your pastor thinks about these things. Sometimes I, I don't watch a lot of TV anymore or much stuff on the internet. It just doesn't interest me. But there's this, this nagging voice in my head, maybe you experienced this at times, that says, man, Pastor James, you've got to be up with the times. You've got to know what's going on with the, with the television, with the internet, and all these podcasts, and all this stuff that's going on that people find so interesting so that you can relate to them better and speak to them in their own terms. And there's, there's a part of that that is relevant, I think. But you know what? The more I, I'm growing in my relationship with Christ, the more I'm finding that some of that stuff just it has no appeal anymore. The the TV and the the what's the what's the greatest podcast that's out there today? And what's the best musical act? And who's doing it? Who was on The Voice this week? And who won The Bachelorette? I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> It doesn't make any difference anymore. Something that used to make a lot of difference in my life, it doesn't anymore. In fact, one time when I was doing my doctoral study, I was at, at, at Baylor, and I went into the uh, activity center to exercise, get on the treadmill one evening, and I was trying to find something. They had, you know, every treadmill has a big screen in front of it that you can watch. And I think I was the only guy in there. <laughs> every, every TV was turned on The Bachelor. So I had to sit there and watch it while I was on the... That was the longest treadmill exercise I've ever done. And people, they were glued to it in this gym. I thought, why? Why are you glued to this? I know it has appeal for some people. But man, the sacrificial system... Of I've got to be up with the times, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that to be, to be seen and to be heard and be valued. That's nonsense. Your worth and your value comes from your relationship with Christ. He died for you. An actor or actress is not going to die for you. Jesus says he'll forgive you. He'll say that you don't have to put on an act. In fact, the, the, the world today needs to see a lot more Christians and churches filled today with people who are tired of trying to win spiritual Grammy Awards. Just disentangle from that. Get the church disentangled from nationalism and idolatry of money and sex and power get disentangled from keeping up appearances friends if we have no other option of salvation no other plan of salvation to offer the world than vote this way make this money get in this socioeconomic bracket do this and do that we're not we if that is our plan of salvation, we shouldn't call ourselves a church. We should just become a school or a political party. We're not a church if we don't profess Christ. And if our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, the gates of hell itself cannot prevail against that. that. That'll preach. That'll preach. Man, I got, I got off track. I got to find my notes again here. Where am I? Okay. The text also says that Jesus' blood is not only sufficient for atoning for your sin, but it's sufficient for cleansing your conscience. Many people today spend a great deal of time trying to soothe a bad conscience. See, the conscience, what is the conscience? It, it is that part of us that joins the spiritual 
with the practical and with the moral. The conscience, there's something built into our conscience that says, whoa, what I did there was wrong. But we spend a lifetime sometimes trying to convince ourselves of a lie that what we thought was wrong was not really wrong. Are you following me? We fight our conscience until that conscience complies with a lie that we keep telling ourselves over and over again. That wasn't wrong. That wasn't wrong. That wasn't wrong. That wasn't wrong until we believe it. That actually is called pride, by the way. It's when you lie to yourself enough about something that is untrue that you make it true and then you try to convince everybody else that it's true. That's pride. And so we do a bunch of these works trying to convince ourselves that sin really isn't sin. But then Jesus shows up and it says, the text says, his blood cleanses our conscience. The word cleanse there in the Greek, it's a word that means catharsis. It means healing, purity. The best translation I can give is this. (laughs) That's what his blood does. You begin to look in the mirror and say, man, what I did was wrong. But Jesus has forgiven and healed me and is healing me. And what's more, when your conscience gets clean, you begin to look at others and say, my goodness, I want to help them and love them. I want to share Jesus with them because they need him just as much as I do. You won't be so concerned with ticking off all the boxes that get you in the good crowd when your conscience is clean. You'll be more concerned about walking as Jesus walked. A clean conscience can work wonders for you, friends. (laughs) Let me tell you from experience. Pick it up and read it. Wow, I'm running out of time. I wish I had like three hours on this text. Some of you are like, Pastor, land the plane. Let's go, brother. Let's land it. One more thing will be done. When Jesus shows up, He becomes our mediator. Verses 15 through 22. The author here is basically wrapping up his argument that he started way back in chapter 8. And the argument is this compare contrast of the Old Testament sacrificial system versus what Jesus had done on the cross. And he's saying that because of Jesus' death and shed blood, perfect shed blood, On the cross, it seals a new covenant. And so Jesus is what is called our mediator. The the way to translate that word is that he's our go-between. He's the one who fixes the relationship that's broken between God and between us as individuals. And not only that, Jesus is the one who has fulfilled and will eternally fulfill all the obligations of that covenant on our behalf, he fulfills that. Did you get that? He fulfills the obligations. You don't have to. He's done it. And and, and the text says that as our mediator, Jesus has totally opened up the doors of access to God. Absolutely. You can pray directly to God. You can go meet directly with God. And most importantly for us, as the author says, is Jesus, as Jesus is the mediator, you can take hold of perpetual life. What a great way to end this message. To those of us who've been called of Christ, which is everybody, everybody's called, 
He has mediated a covenant between us and God where those who are called and bow the knee receive and take hold of perpetual life, the inheritance that belongs to Jesus Christ. You get to take hold of that promise and hold on to it tight. The good news that we can announce is through Jesus, we enter the promised land. Through Jesus, we experience the inheritance of God, which is eternal, perpetual life, no matter what comes along and what is thrown at us. And Jesus is everything we are looking for in this life and in the life to come. So I've got to ask you, here's where you get to make a choice. You get to make a decision, and it's not just Pastor James up here rambling. What will your response today be to Christ? Are you struggling today with your sin? Are you putting on an outward face? Are you still working according to a sacrificial system of mystical religion, sex, money, and politics? Do you want to put that behind you? I hope so. Jesus has showed up. The children are singing in the streets. Pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. Put off the old self. Put on Christ. When Jesus shows up, friends, it's time to respond. How will you respond today? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this text. Lord, I feel like we've just scratched the surface, the tip of the surface of Hebrews chapter 9 today. It is so full of wisdom and encouragement and things we need to hear. Oh Lord, many of us today are still stuck in trying to do things. Perform rituals. Offer sacrifices to appease the popular gods of our day. And it's getting us nowhere and nowhere fast. But Lord, you have come and once and for all died for us, spilling your precious blood to seal a covenant where the law of God is written on our hearts, whereby grace we are saved through faith and not by our works. Oh God, what a great message of good news and hope and joy we have. And so I pray today for those who are discouraged, for those of for those of us who keep on trying the old way and it just doesn't work. Help us today to put on Christ. Help us to respond as Many have responded to you since day one of your ministry, all the way through the apostles and Paul and the first century believers and the second century church, all the way through Augustine and now down to us in this room. Help us, Lord, to know you are the way and the truth and the life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to now open up the altar for you to come pray. I'll be down here at the front. I'm going to ask a couple of our deacons, uh, Laverne and uh, Cheryl, if they're able to come. And you can pray with one of our deacons. You can come pray with me or say, Pastor James, I, I, I need Jesus. I need this forgiveness. I, I, I'm tired of the old way. I want to be saved. I want to be a believer in Jesus Christ and have that new life. Maybe you just want to, you, you are a believer, but you, you've you been stumbling along and you're here today to say, Pastor, I, I, I'm rededicating my life. I'm recommitting. I'm, I'm 
here to to be a part of a church that's going to be caring and missional and active. So as we stand and as we sing in just a moment, you come down front as God leads you to do so. Maybe you need to just go pray with someone who's around you or with someone you you really trust and bond with. However the Spirit is uh, motivating you to respond today and calling us, calling you. Let's do that. Would you stand and let's respond. Savior said, My strength in thee is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin say many weeks uh, as we do this invitation a, an altar call or an invitation to respond uh, to Christ is not just a thing that we do every uh, for few for a few minutes every Sunday morning the the invitation of God is always open and so if you uh, feel a tugging on your heart and and say pastor James I, I need to talk to you at another point or um, if there's anything our church can do to connect with you and help you in this responding that you're doing to the Holy Spirit, please reach out to us. We certainly are open and appreciate that. Okay, I'm going to ask our uh, people who take up the offering to go ahead and come to the front. I almost said our offerers, but that wasn't going to make any sense. The offerers. Um, yeah, as we take up our offering, let's uh, remember that we do this as a form of worship. It's not uh, even as I just prayed about, our, our giving is not uh, to earn brownie points with God or with each other. It's not about your social economic status. Uh, this is about you giving to the Lord. And our cooperative gifts work together as God uses them for the advancement of his kingdom through missions and evangelism and discipleship. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the time now we get to respond and worship through giving of tithes and offerings. 
Lord, we do this as an act of worship, sacrificially giving because you've given so much to us. It is obviously impossible, Lord, for us to pay you back for what you've done for us, and you didn't call us to pay you back. But you have called us to give, and to give cheerfully, and to give liberally, to support the work of ministry at home and around the world. So we do that now, and we do it in your name. Amen. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, a few announcements before we are dismissed. First of all, we have our lunch Wednesday that we're going to serve down at UT at the Baptist Student Ministry uh, facility that we have there. There's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer if you haven't already signed up for that. We're feeding about 150 students on Wednesday. Um, we would gladly take your food today uh, or at 9 a.m. tomorrow. We're going to load up about 10 and go. Um, and if you want staff to do quality control, we'll be very happy to, to abide. Wednesday. Oh, what did I say? Tomorrow? Oh, wow. I took that spring forward an hour really seriously. So, yeah, it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Today's not Tuesday. If it was, this would be weird. Uh, Wednesday, we will have our BSM lunch. So we'll need that. If you want to bring food today, that's fine. Um, if it can keep until Wednesday. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to throw it out, so that wouldn't be good. All right, so BSM lunch coming up down at UT on Wednesday. Um, if you want to be a part of Vacation Bible School as a leader, uh, we really need to know that soon. I know you're thinking VBS is in the summertime, but that's actually not a long ways away. We need to know if you're going to be a part of that. Sign-up sheets are also out on the, the info table in the foyer. VBS this year is June 12th through the 16th. Our online registration for kids uh, began this week. As of Wednesday, we had like nine already signed up. 27. Right? We have 27 signed up now, and it's just March. It's just spring break. So um, can you imagine what it's going to be like, like the week before Vacation Bible School? Uh, it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty hectic. So we need to know if you can help, um, because that's going to dictate uh, how we organize a few things. Also, our mixed signal Zoom group uh, our last uh, gathering will be tonight. We wrap up our discipleship study on Zoom uh, this evening. Ladies game day is Tuesday from 2 to 4 over in the CMB, Community Ministry Building. And then last but certainly not least, our mission trip uh, this summer is going to be July 16 through 18. We're going down to McAllen. We're going to be building a house on a parking lot. Uh, of the convention center there as the annual meeting of Texas Baptist takes place. We're cooperating with Buckner International uh, on this effort and uh, really, really excited about that. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, please let us know. Did you want to say anything more about that? No, not yet. The 16th through 18th is, is the smaller date. We're probably looking at closer to 15th through 20th. Oh, okay, very good. But we don't have exact dates just yet. Um, should know in the next couple weeks. Excellent. All right. So um, pretty exciting summer is already shaping up. Um, and I know it's weird to talk about that. It's just March. But uh, it's flying by already, y'all, if you didn't know that already. Um, so let's stand, and we'll be dismissed through uh, prayer. And if you're a guest or newcomer and want to say hello and uh, chat a little bit, I'll be out in the uh, foyer after the service is concluded. John, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Uh, Father God, we are thankful for this day. We're thankful for the weather outside, and uh, we see the uh, rites of spring happening before our eyes. We're thankful for the trees blossoming and 
uh, just uh, the great weather we're having the last couple uh, days, the next few. And yeah, we just pray for uh, this time that we've had together. We know that your spirit was present in and amongst us. We do pray that we would be reminded each and every day um, that Jesus um, is at the center of, of, of all that we are and, and all that we uh, claim to be God and that um, he welcomes us as sinners and to his family and and in fact encourages us to to identify as as his Christ followers even though we don't always uh, live up to the mark but we are we come to that relationship as broken people and that um, it's through his blood and his atonement that God sees us as pure and holy. God, go with us this day. We pray in your name. Amen.